Hi, I'm Stephanie Fortunato, Director of Providence's Department of Art, Culture, and Tourism. I'm pleased to be here today with the public artists of PVD Fest. You know, usually we kick off summer by being together in downtown Providence, celebrating all the creative capital has to offer. We've celebrated with 100,000 of our closest friends, visual arts, performing arts, food, all of the things that make Providence, Providence. Of course, unfortunately, we were not able to do that this year. We were thrilled to be able to still present the public art that we had commissioned for the festival and to bring a little bit of the spirit of PVD Fest to Providence this summer. I'm joined today in conversation with Allison Newsom and Deborah Spears Moorhead, who've done an amazing piece at 444 Westminster on the Empire Plaza called The Three Sisters Rain Keep. Hi, Allison and Deborah. Hi there. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. I have Karen Giusti, who did the dream weave on the Civic Center garage. Hi, Karen. Hi, how you doing today? <laughs> Great. And I have Jerry Ehrlich, who did Head in the Clouds, Feet on the Ground, the sculpture in front of City Hall this summer. Hi, Jerry. Hey. I'm also joined by Gina Rodriguez-Drix, the amazing cultural affairs manager for the Department of Art, Culture, and Tourism, and our public art administrator who has helped these artists install these works under really unprecedented situation. Hi, Gina. Hey, how's it going? Great. So let's get started. I want to hear a little bit about these works. Gina, do you want to ask some questions of the artists? Sure. Um, well, First of all, thank you all for commissioning and oh, sorry, thank you all for fabricating and installing such incredible pieces this year. Um, I'll start with Allison and Deborah. I'm really excited about your collaboration. I know that this was a first time collaboration for the two of you. Um, just would love to hear more about how you came to work together and what the process was like and how your work evolved over time towards the final installation. When I came up with the idea of creating a rain cape, which is a rain harvesting sculpture. So it's a utility sculpture that acts as a work of art that I, that, you know, I want to be aesthetically exciting and form and content, but also is functional and can harvest water for landscape use. And came up with the idea of um, be violet. And we were just discussing that I, the, the whole name changed to Three Sisters with Deb coming on board, um, who we created a collaboration, um, starting with the fact that I wanted to do a demo garden for my rain keep to water, which was previously bee violet, which is how bees see ultraviolet light and patterns that we don't see on flowers to help them zoom in. And I created this big magenta piece and everything, thinking violet, violet. And then Deb came on board to design the, um, help me with the garden, which is three sisters. Um, and Deb can talk about that. Um, a, a Native American indigenous way of, of creating, interplanting squash, beans, and corn um, together. And she started telling me the origins, origin story of, of, of her people. And, it's very much about three sisters, the squash, beans, and corn. I'm like, oh my God, we gotta make the rain chains about this. So Deb designed and the, the rain chains, which are gorgeous. And it's really, uh, the three sisters became more and more important. That's why we're calling it Three Sisters. I'll let Deb talk about that. I met Allison in Providence at the um, library, uh, Oneyville Library. Uh, Micah had invited me to um, a gathering of artists for um, brainstorming. So um, at the end of the meeting, Allison and I approached each other and she told me about what she, she does as a sculptor. And I told her what I do as a, um, you know, artist. As I'm a 2D, you know, um, painter. I have some sculpture, sculptures, um, you know, in my background and, um, but, and I am also a performer. So uh, she um, told me, you know, we should collaborate. She told me where she lives, which is, and where her studio is, which was a really significant um, place for my nation, my, I'm from the Wampanoag Nation. So where her gallery, I mean, yeah, where her gallery, where her studio is, is on top of Massasoit's um, spring site. And that's a very sacred place for our 
our nation and uh, because Massasoit was our the supreme sachem back in 1620. Uh, so uh, Allison called me one day and asked me if um, I wanted to collaborate with her on um, her sculpture, her rain catching sculpture, and she said that she wanted to do it on the three sisters and that she should um, really be consulting with the Native American on this, um, on that question of it. So uh, I thought that the best thing to do would be to teach her what we would do traditionally. Uh, so it was like, um, you know, it was just like bringing a friend to my play areas <laughs> because, you know, as when I grew up, we used to go to Gilbert Stewart birthplace and gather the buckies that would go inside of the um, three sisters planting. So Allison and I decided to meet so that we could go fishing. And that just turned into a lot of adventures and they were real <laughs> fun adventures. I mean, it was just like being a kid and like, let's go out exploring, you know, and, but we have a goal. So we, uh, we looked at a few fishing places and with the COVID-19, a lot was closed. So then, um, we, I brought it to, um, we did some freshwater fishing uh, next to my house and that was fun. <laughs> uh, it was a lot of fun. And then, then we, we kept fishing until the um, buckies were running. So in between going fishing, we would meet and go and see if the buckies were running. So then we actually made it for when the buckies were running and uh, we had a blast. Um, I, as a Native American, I still can take the buckies from the stream, but um, uh, Allison needed them. So we collected some that were dead, which we needed dead ones anyways, um, to put in the planting. So um, the origins of the story is, um, it's of the three sisters, is that the um, creation story from the East Coast, that comes, um, it originates from, the Iroquois, but it was ours too, and we borrowed it because, you know, we lost a lot of our culture after King Philip's War, where the Iroquois held on to it, but we have the same kind of um, traditions and the same um, creation story. So our creation story is that there was a whole nother dimension in the sky world, and there were sky world people living there, and one of the chiefs, um, he saw a hole in the tree, and his wife, there's like a few versions of it, you know, some um, was, the, the, the versions are like a lot different than each other, but I'm just gonna kind of make it straightforward. Um, so they looked into the hole in the um, tree and the great chief, it was her husband, he pulled up the tree while she was looking in the hole to see what was going on in the hole, which was, another dimension, which was, you know, this dimension where we're living. And there was a huge flood. And so while she was looking, she fell in. And it's, you know, some stories say he pushed her in because different reasons. Other stories say that she fell in because, you know, she lost her balance because she was pregnant. Well, she fell in and she fell down to the sky world. And then there was lots of meetings of all the animals to um, figure out what they were going to do with this uh, woman that was falling from the sky. So they, there's whole lots of stories on their meetings, but what ends up happening is that uh, the swans and geese um, go underneath her and hold her. And then there's a lot of meetings with the animals, um, four-leggeds and the crawly things and the swimmy things, and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do with this woman that falls. So a muskrat goes down to the bottom of the um, flood and finds the earth and brings the dirt up and spreads and the turtle um, is nominated to be the person or the animal, the being, spirit, I don't know what he, um, that would, I guess he's a four-legged or she's a four-legged. Um, the muskrat puts the dirt on the four, on the top of the turtle and spreads it as far east as possible, far west, far north, or far south, so the four directions. And that's a lot of what our culture is based on, the four directions and how everyone 
from every direction is equal to each other. And that is what forms the earth. And uh, so Sky Woman is gently put on the earth and she falls into the earth. Um, and then she has her babies. She has two sons. One's the good son, one's the evil son. And they, you know, have a lot of um, arguments on what to do with the earth. Like the good son's doing everything beautiful, like flowers and, um, you know, a beautiful day where the bad son is bringing storms. And when the good son puts flowers out, the bad son puts prickers on it. And, you know, then the good son makes beautiful waterways and then the bad son puts snakes and alligators in it. And so it goes on and on and on like that. Uh, and then the sky woman finally becomes very aggravated and tired of listening to the two of them fight. And she slowly just lays down and dies. So her body is um, the landscape of this area. We have like certain parts of her that we call the hip, the head, the arms, the legs. And out of her, um, out of her toes comes the potatoes and um, different squash. And, you know, out of her body becomes all the food that we, that the native people need to um, sustain themselves. So, but um, in, so when we plant the three sisters, we plant them with, um, traditionally we plant them with the, um, swimmy things, you know, the fish. And we make sure that that's underneath a mound that's not, that's this equivalent to a nine month pregnant woman. And the fish is used to fertilize. And then you plant the three sisters and one's corn, one beans, and one is squash. And they all um, work to um, keep each other strong. Uh, one is to hold up the, the, the blonde one um, sister. She's to hold up the um, string beans. And then the squash is the one that runs away. And then there's beans. One of them gives nutrition to the beans. I forgot which one it is. But there's a whole story about the three sisters where a native man came um, by and he was um, playing his flute and they were all allured by his flute. And so one ran away and they that was the one that was the squash that runs along the ground. And they couldn't find her. And then uh, the other one, String Beans, she ran away trying to find the Indian man and her sister. And they couldn't find her. And then the tall one with the blonde hair, she still stood there hoping that they'd come back. And she grow, grew old and her hair got all dry. And, you know, then you open, and she had a green shawl on. And then the shawl falls off. And then uh, she goes into the house, the long house, and she finds that they're all there with the Indians and that's the three beings, I mean the three sisters, and they all come back together. So that's that's a short, short, short version of the story because the story can go on for three or four days. It's a festival for three or four days. So Allison and I went and got the um, Bucky's and it was, I mean, it was so much fun because we were like little kids and they, they have a, um, a enclosure like made of um, fencing where the buckies can't go up, but they uh, have natural instinct to go up to that area because, you know, I've been going there my whole life and half of my life they used to go up that area, but then somebody, maybe DEM, closed it up. So the fish were getting through it and then they were getting stuck up on the, on the top of, a, of the... Um, uh, land that uh, water, I don't know, uphill. It was an uphill um, way that they had to go and where they would get stuck, where Gilbert Stewart's birthplace had closed it off. So they would just die in there and they weren't laying their eggs where they were supposed to in the pond. So Allison and I were pretty upset about that and we were try <laughs> trying to change everything so that they could get back up to the pond. And we were taking some that were stuck and we were putting them in our bucket and bringing them up to the pond. And we just had, uh, it was a very eventful day. <laughs> so then she asked me to draw the pictures and I drew the pictures in of the creation story. And then from there, she took them to Thailand. 
and that's where I'll stop from here. Um, I've been working with a family in Chiang Mai uh, at the Silver Palace, and they're internationally they're most known for repose, which of course we're all hip to now because Gorham just had their show at the MFA at the uh, RISD Museum, and they even show the tools of repose, which is hammering out the silver. But repose was brought here from the east, and in it, in it's uh, Asia. Asia is the oldest sort of carbon dated repose. You know, it's been dated back to uh, Buddha's tomb and all kinds of interesting things. So I um, work with this amazing family with Tim Ampro and Frank um, and her family and spend months with her um, over the years doing a lot of hammered aluminum. And I bring all my designs in aluminum, in this case, Deb's designs. And they loved it. They just wanted to hear all about the story. And that just reminds me that I want to somehow get that story to them because it every time I hear it, there's something new I hear. Um, and we hammered it all out and you can see it hanging in the rain chain. So the rain hits the upper canopy, comes down the rain chains into the vessel. It also goes into the petals or wings and goes into the vessel. So the, the, the rain keep harvests in two ways, the upper canopy, canopy and through the petals. And I'm a pioneer. For many, many years, we hold the uh, festival for 30 years now in San Rafael in California. And the work is very influenced by, by biomimicry, which is now a word everybody's hearing all the time. And um, I grew up in the Redwoods. Um, I'm a native Californian. And the Redwoods catch the fog and the rain and the upper high, you know, they're the highest tree in the forest. And they bring it down and they create their own rain catch the dew and bring it down. So I think the upper canopy and the verticality of my work is all goes back to my origins, which is the redwoods. And this idea of how redwoods catch the rain in the fog um, and bring it down to their roots. So there's a lot of um, interesting sort of biomimicry uh, meditations on this piece, um, as well as the rain chains and that you can water the garden. Um, and I know you had questions that you wanted to ask me, so. Yeah, so uh, what was it like to do this installation during the pandemic? Well, it, interestingly enough, we, 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 we made the date a few weeks in advance. We we're very organized for the forklift to meet uh, us and Amy was great. And, and it was the day of the first protest. So a lot of people were walking by with signs uh, I have footage, I have some pictures of people with their signs and they're on their way to the protest, very um, determined and, and very focused on that. And, um, and, I, and we were there installing the work and, and just thinking, wow, you know, uh, this is a huge day. Um, we're here, we're, we're in Providence, um, this protest is happening. Um, that was the first one. And, um, and then the second uh, protest was a day that I went to water the uh, rain cape. That was a really big one of 10,000 people. And I talked to a lot of people and um, yeah, it, it just is interesting that the two main dates that I was there were the two days of the protest and, um, and I have footage of that. Um, but everybody was very, um, you know, people were on a mission. And there wasn't a lot of chit chat about my, what I was doing. I mean, the focus was that, was, you know, Black Lives Matter. But there would be a little bit of interest and I figured, you know, they'll come, uh, this is just not the time or place. I was just like, well, check back, this will be up through November, you know, get on with the good work you're doing. But um, I was there with Wes and my daughter, Arden Morris. And um, we just, you know, we're really focused on getting the piece together, which is a lot of work. And um, focused in, uh, I, I returned to Warren and just thought what an important day it was for, for Rhode Island and for the world at large, you know? I was very aware of that. Absolutely, what an extraordinary yeah. moment in time. Uh, these installations, you know, have come in, in unprecedented ways on so many levels, um, but that's really powerful that those were the two days it happened to be downtown doing these installations. So, I wanted to comment that when I brought my drawings to meet Allison, we met at a, uh, you know, restaurant and that was before COVID-19 COVID and she had her friend with her whose name is Sherwin Williams. And 
she, Allison had told me that Shoreham is uh, Roger Williams' descendant. So as soon as we met, it was like, history was just starting all over again because, you know, I'm a descendant of Massasoit, she's a descendant of Roger Williams, and they, it, for Rhode Island history, it was the our uh, two descendants that were the reason why Rhode Island is, exists. So we found that to be pretty exciting and we became fast friends and uh, we, we, we're still friends. But then she, I, they asked me to do the um, land statement acknowledgement, land acknowledgement statement to start off the PVD Fest. And so I thought it would only be, you know, natural and significant and appropriate to have her um, be part of the land acknowledgement uh, statement. So, you know, she spoke about, you know, how Massasoit had protected her from the Massachusetts Bay Colony because uh, not, you know, Massasoit had protected her descendant, Roger Williams, from Massachusetts Bay Colony who, who were um, persecuting Roger Williams because of, you know, freedom of religion and plus he was defending the um, Wampanoags from all their land being taken from them. So we just become fast friends and we've been doing things together since then. So I just wanted to put that in. Yeah, when, when they met, they both uh, got, had literally got goosebumps over their entire bodies. It was bizarre. Mm. <laughs> yep. Honestly, just hearing the story, same. <laughs> Tina, do we want to check in about the Washington Street, the Civic Center garage? Let's hear from Karen a little bit. Uh, well, I was so absolutely uh, thrilled to get that site. Um, I heard that I was a finalist in, oh, I think it was December 6th. Now, um, I'm also a citizen of, of Italy. I, I live in uh, Abruzzo as well. And by the time that I was uh, working on my uh, proposal ideas for um, what I was thinking about the space, I was already hearing some horror stories from uh, Northern Italy uh, about something that was going terribly wrong. Um, I uh, was in uh, with my family in Rhode Island and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, where I live with them. And uh, actually, I um, was looking at the building uh, when I knew that I was a finalist. I was, I was absolutely ecstatic uh, when Gina told me about it. <laughs> because as I said in my proposal, it's one of my favorite kinds of spaces. Um, I um, knew immediately when I looked at the structure of the building, even in photographs of previous sculptures and having seen the building before, that it actually made um, a, a perfect uh, weaving uh, structure for me. Uh, and it was the, 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 the warp actually the, is the pillars and the weft is, you know, all the ribbons that I intended to, you know, weave through the piece. Um, and um, growing up in, you know, Rhode Island, um, uh, it was most of my history. My family would go around and we would shop at uh, remnant stores and factories. So the factories and the working um, uh, te textile industry was very much uh, all throughout my childhood. And we would gather, you know, my family, family of artists, we would gather remnants and make things. and um work with different um uh you know remnants we would find or ribbons whatever would be produced and really there is such a history of the textile mills in rhode island um that this piece when it started out i had wanted to go and visit each of the mills that are still existing as well as the museums and um, you know, like the Peabody, many many museums have samples of textiles, um, you know, that I could work with, and also contemporary, current samples of mills that are still in operation. But everything was rather shut down by the time 
I began to really develop the piece. And uh, um, I knew that um, the idea of the idea of weaving is extremely symbolic in my life. And to me, the title also is a little bit different when I started out. It was actually dream, dream weaving for the third space, which to me means a place where all peoples can come together uh, in peace and begin to work on um, uh, a utopian society. It is just a concept but there is something about Rhode Island, there's something about Providence that I feel so strongly that there is such a possibility of this happening. Uh, you know, of course it won't happen without a glitch, it won't happen without a lot of, lot of work. Um, but what attracted me so much um, to work in Providence was the team that was set up at the, at the at the Cultural Affairs Office and the Visitors Association and all the other associations because they were developing programming that I really hadn't seen in place else. Um, so I really, I really wanted to do something, but also, um, you know, in the future be part of a team like that in Providence because I think that is really the way to build a third space. And um, uh, when I started weaving, um, designing these ribbons, you can see my, my tools in back of me. I was terrified that I wasn't gonna be able to get any equipment. You know, I was really terrified um, that I would not be able to get the backlight paper I needed, the inks I needed. I had to, I had to build this machine in back of me to pull through um, a laminate coating uh, 150 foot long vinyl coating for the piece to be able to be um, UV stabilized and be able to be shown outside. Um, and what I did was I researched um, every culture and I designed um, inspirational patterns, patterns that really inspired me uh, that, that, you know, uh, often showed up in those cultures and then I wanted to interweave them really very, very much to, to talk about interconnectedness, to talk about the fact that really uh, there's, you know, this day and age, we are all going to be uh, irreversibly connected. And the fact that um, even scientists, um, you know, talk about, uh, our brains as being entangled all over the world. Um, there's some theories about that, um, that really were, were that connected. Um, so that um, the way that I wanted to weave this together, I wanted to make a giant tapestry that kind of represented um, uh, concepts of patterns from all different cultures. Um, my original idea was to invite other artists, but that, as I moved along became increasingly more and more difficult, um, you know, to pull in other artists, even Providence artists. I had wanted to invite some artists that I was talking to in Providence to maybe design a panel, which a panel, by what I mean by that is a two foot by 150 foot long print of a design that would be their concept. Um, but the designs also, um, they, uh, go not only through different cultures, but through different times, through different time and space and concepts. And they are very entangled. For instance, um, there is a, a purple dragon print that is from, I believe, Ming Dynasty in, in China. And actually, uh, there is another um, uh, print that is, um, Italian, it's from, it's from, uh, you know, uh, actually Venice, it's Venetian. And it has um, a connection in there because uh, the silks were actually inspirational to the Venetians and they brought, you know, the silk and the method of, of working with the silk into their fabric making and design. And there's also techniques that um, go from African peoples to island peoples uh, that are similar techniques. Um, and I'm hoping at some point to maybe uh, uh, produce a symposium with some of these people who are still practicing these uh, 
uh, crafts of making their, their different weavings. But we can see what happens. I was thinking maybe September, October, but I'm not certain what will happen yet. Um, well, I suppose I should let somebody ask a question. I don't mean to uh, go on like this, but you know. I have a question. How did she get up to that that high, that height? Did she have oh. like a scaffolding or did she have like a truck that? <laughs> that was me. <laughs> I was the I was the only artist working on that job. I, 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 that was so kind of you to ask. That really was. I, I really so much, I'm touched by your question because we were all struggling with this cohort situation and it became very clear to me, you know, that I couldn't, I couldn't endanger other people. I couldn't endanger students. I think very, very early on, I, very early on, I reached out to uh, um, Brown University, to RISD, and they were so behind, up against it, they couldn't even answer back, you know. And, I, and at that point, really, I, I couldn't bring um, a student into that risk zone. There's just nothing I could do. So I know as, all, as a, a strong Italian woman, I don't have all that much strength, but I have endurance. I can really, if I just take my time, I can, I can move a mountain if I really try, but it's going to take me a little while. So I had to start weaving very early on, probably the beginning of May. Um, Gina was so great. She helped me get access to the, um, the, the, the site. And I literally was inside the building, um, passing the weft, like one bigger roll of the print one hand to the next and hugging hugging the poles that were the warp you know so i was basically hugging the whole, the building the whole time i was there oh the spider woman weaving your web <laughs> well so many cultures do have um you know uh, uh imagery of spiders or legends um i think the african legend of um kent cloth is two brothers um, in the jungle and they come across the spider. That's one of them. I am not, I know there is Indian legends of the spider woman. That's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be love to have an education about that. I would love to hear, you know, if you could, if you could tell me the story that I would love that. And I know the, the Italians and Greeks have Minerva, who's the goddess who had, had a dual um, with another goddess, I forget which one, well, she lost and she ended up having to be a spider for the rest of her existence, weaving the world into existence every day and then taking it apart every night. And yeah, I mean, that's what I felt like. <laughs> but it was um, really, it was a very con contemplative and amazing way to spend the, the COVID season. And on top of it, a, a, a friend of mine passed away, which is Christo. And him and his wife were a beautiful people. Uh, they were beautiful people. Um, I only knew them briefly because, uh, uh, you know, because we all work temporarily. Like, um, uh, your works are all temporary and ephemeral. And so sometimes they get grouped together. And for some reason, we ended up in uh, the uh, showing some group thing and they were so lovely and so nice because they were so great and I was just a little sculptor you know and uh, but as I was weaving that piece you know I'm trying to do do the entire building I was thinking of them and holding counsel and just uh, missing them but you know it's gonna be what it is so sorry for your loss Karen yeah, there was we the whole the whole the whole world has lost some a great spirit, you know, two great spirits. But this is way this is life, right? Mm. Yeah, and you know, but I hope to come and plant the garden and water and <laughs> help you guys with the garden if I can help in any way. <laughs> Bring fish. <laughs> You're amazing. No, you guys are amazing. I can't, I can't, that's uh, the, the most wonderful part. I mean, this is really the most wonderful part of uh, projects like this is you really get to meet the other artists. And I propose a big party um, uh, at the, at the, at the, um, at the 
at the, at the garden site. I think we, should, we need to have a big party there. Or okay. <laughs> As soon as we can safely figure that out, right? <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, we need, to part, we need to party a little bit, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, it reminds me so much of like, I did the 14 or 15 or 16 foot um, mural right in, in August of last year. And oh. I had no idea how I was going to get to the top of the, of the uh, cement to paint the mural. And oh. so, you know, I came up with a concept and I was just really hoping that concept worked. But I had, yeah. I had two RISD students and we tried to like, um, we had, we were projecting the, the image onto the wall and then wow. we were waiting for the lighting to be perfect. And we found out like the lighting is not going to be perfect. So I just jumped up, uh, got up on a ladder and started um, drawing. And they, the RISD student said to me, I am totally amazed that you would just get up there and just get get to it whether you know the concepts that you decided work and that's what reminds me of you I was like that's right when she that's was right. designing this sculpture what concepts were you thinking of, of how you I mean you can look at it and say that would be that building is up so high and I would love to weave it but then you think like you know how am I going to do it and yeah I love you your just, determination you're like oh. I can just move a mountain as long as I have an idea <laughs> I love it. I just hope it's gonna work, you know, because I really didn't know. I just, I yeah. just, I learned how to how to free fall and trust my instincts. But I cannot wait to, to revisit your mural, and yeah, it really is those. What I think what those kids were seeing is your level of experience and your faith, you know, your your faith and your uh, your inner core, you know, that yeah. you. Sometimes just to have the t you have to take a leap of faith, you know, and that's what... really. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can't wait to uh, revisit all the pieces and just, uh, you know, have the luxury of just uh, spending some time with all the pieces. And Jerry, can you tell us a little bit about your piece? Uh, it's, a, it's an unusual piece for me uh, in that. Uh, Normally I'll kind of have a feeling for something and then sketch it and let it evolve and let it gestate for a long time. And this one just jumped out. And uh, the initial sketch was like three inches by an inch and a half. And the only change that took place from that to its actual create, during its actual creation was uh, during the pandemic kind of thought maybe let's leave the center of the clouds dark instead of polishing the whole thing. And uh, otherwise it was as originally conceived, drawn and executed. I hear you had a little trouble though. Did you went in the installation day? We had an interesting installation day. It actually, uh, it started at five o'clock in the morning uh, because uh, the piece was a touch taller than I originally designed it to be. <laughs> and uh, we just fit under the electrical wires t uh, at the bottom of my driveway, mounting it onto the flatbed, the flatbed which we went to Maine to buy the middle of March, blew the engine on the truck when we went up to get the flatbed. COVID hit big time. Uh, flatbed still not registered. <laughs> so we went up with uh, plates that were three months expired and uh, we, uh, we had driven the route uh, a couple of days before uh, with me standing in the back of the, uh, the truck with a stick that was the height of the piece uh, and finding out that uh, there's, uh, there's an extra inch on most bridges. <laughs> so the underpasses are normally 13.6 plus, but the piece was 14.2. Uh, and uh, there were two spots where we had to find a new route, but we got there at, uh, at about 8.30 and she was waiting for us with the uh, uh, forklift, um, but uh, the, the extensions on the forklift weren't big enough to pick up the piece. So we had to wait for a while and 
the officer in City Hall came out and said, uh, here there's going to be a big rally. And if it, uh, <laughs> things get out of hand, you may have to leave. So we said, whatever. <laughs> and uh, so we waited for about an hour and a half to get the forks. And we got them, got the piece up, off, dropped, and she ran out of gas. Oh. We had to wait another hour and a half. So now we're 1130 and the rally is going to take place at 12. And we, the gas showed up, we cranked it up and we were out of there at five minutes of 12 as everybody was streaming into the uh, Burnside Park. And uh, it was an interesting installation. Wow. All of your stories of these installations, I mean, it's truly just been such a remarkable, remarkable period. So many things that in the beginning when you put your proposals in, I could have imagined, you know, the scenarios in terms of COVID guidelines and public health plans. And then with the uprisings, I feel like, you know, it's just such an extraordinary time. These, these installations really are markers in our public spaces of all of that. But I'm glad that we have the stories behind them so we can really know what the experience was was like there of, of working under these conditions and then the context of, of understanding the works. Gina, I wonder for you what it's like to hear these stories. Now you work so hard, you've done such an incredible job behind the scenes, um, really working with all of our colleagues at the city. What is it like to, to hear these stories from these artists and then see the works in, in the public spaces? Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. Um, I, I'm just, I feel so honored to have had the chance to work with all of you and it's been such an exciting journey and just listening to you all speak um, today, just, it's a really special moment. You know, Karen, you said how this work, how public art helps create a third space and hearing all that um, that's coming up, there really is a level of conjuring um, that gets created when public art gets put out into the world. And, and you know, these are three very different pieces from, from four very different artists. And yet there's a cohesiveness that's present because of the moment in time that we are in, but also because of the, uh, the origin stories of these pieces. And so with, um, with Deborah sharing the Wampanoag origin story with Allison and then developing a piece that literally went around the world in its development, um, coming back to a place in Empire Plaza, which used to be a salt cove, um, so having this incredible environmentalist and indigenous um, piece that's also speaking to what was and then what will come, I think is just incredible and connects so beautifully to Karen's uh, work on the garage of looking at the different textile histories from around the world and thinking of how we move forward um, together in ways that honor all of our origins, but also honor a collective future that is, that is possible. And then with Jerry's work with head in the feet and um, head in the clouds and feet on the ground, really thinking, uh, you know, putting that piece in as people are marching in this uprising towards Burnside Plaza, it's just this beautiful commentary on what's possible when we have that determination that Allison spoke of and we are marching with our feet, but also we're remembering those that came before, those that will come after and making sure that our big ideas are in the clouds with Sky Woman, but also moving forward, um, that you can have both your head in the clouds and your feet on the ground at the same time. This is this beautiful cohesiveness that I don't think we could have ever planned for. And yet just hearing you all talk, it just came together so beautifully. So I'm just really excited that they, those pieces are up and that you all were able to, you know, fabricate and install during just this wild moment in all of our lives. And, also that the spirit of PVD Fest is able to still hold, um, you know, physically there in, in Providence. You know, I think the festival every year is such a beautiful moment of a time where we all get to just celebrate life. And at a time that we can't physically be there together to do that, the public art pieces really, for me, were a moment of, are, are sort of like holding that energy and just saying, you know, we're, we're all here, we're gonna push through another world is possible. And it's just, it's just a beautiful, um, beautiful homage to all the things that are happening in this moment. Even if they weren't even the intent behind the pieces, it just kind of like, it's impossible not to make meaning out of it. Um, so thank you all for just 
speaking so beautifully about your work and your process and all the, the, I, I also love like the technical installation, you know, problems that, like the image of, of you, Karen, like hugging this mammoth garage wall in order to move a vinyl, 150 foot yard, like your vinyl piece around it and oh my god jerry that day when the forklift was not big enough and all that concern it was just you know you gotta laugh and it sounds like alice and deborah also had so many laughs and in fishing and, and trying to figure this all out so i'm glad that we all can all find the humor and the it's almost like a sitcom you know getting the public art out and folks don't always think about like what you know, it's, it's art in the end and it looks beautiful, but there is so much mechanically that happens in terms of design and, and fabrication and then the install. It's always a bit of a crazy ride. So um, thank you for highlighting the pieces that um, can often get overlooked. So. Right back at you, Gina. <laughs> thank thank you, everybody. The process is part of the art. Amazing team. Yeah. This has been so amazing. Thank you all so much. Before we close, I want to ask you just briefly, if you could just leave us with a thought, what does public art mean to you? This, we've talked about how it's been, this has been a very different installation than, than your past works, but we'll start with you, Karen. What does public art mean to you? Well, it is absolutely, in, in, this, in this instance, it was so vital to bring light and color and spirituality and something uplifting uh, through this incredibly strange and dark time in the beginning and uh so it just means the way that you know we can we can send out those signals and you know people really do feel it you know i had a lot of people walking by and encouraging me i mean that was amazing so I think that's what public art does. It brings sometimes light into very dark situations. Allison? Well, it, especially in these times, especially in these times with monuments being taken down, mm -hmm. it's been a time to reflect on the responsibility of an artist. And when we design something, especially if it's permanent, um, what our message is. And if we're gonna get called out in a couple hundred years. Um, and for me to stick with an environmental um, base and, and something that um, is site specific and interactive. Um, normally people would, would be invited to water the garden, but right now we can't have people touching and uh, all of that. But usually we have a lot of watering cans around for everybody to participate. Um, so the idea of interactive, something that is exciting visually um aesthetically formally but has also important content what about you jerry what does public art mean to you well normally in a uh, gallery situation or a museum situation you have people who come with an intent and uh, often uh, preconceived notions of what they want to see and what they were thinking about and their own critical and philosophical uh, background but in public art, you get to find people who don't know they're gonna find a piece of public art and surprise them and hopefully give them a different view of reality than they uh, normally carry with them every day. And hopefully they take that away with them and they see the world in a slightly different way that uh, broadens or at least you're sharing what you, the way you see the world and uh, sharing that with them. And hopefully that helps them to look at things differently and lead their lives a little differently and make the world a better place. Deborah, what about you? Well, I've been known as a conceptual artist. So, you know, I, when I make my art, I'm usually trying to communicate an idea. And, you know, as artists, we have that gift of, it's a different way of using our mind, our spirit, our brain. So we can evoke, you know, different feelings from the general public on, you know, the concept of what, of what we're trying to um, communicate. And on the other side, you know, 
like Allison was saying, sculpture and monuments are all, you know, as much as you don't want to say that they are, but they have a culture a attached to them. So um, it's nice to be able to have, you know, you can use, I use my art as cultural sustainability. It's I like, I like to do native people to show that, you know, we're here and we're still here and, you know, we have our concepts. Uh, so public art to me is a place where you can put your concepts and your sensitivities it, um, out into the world and have the world experience how you see the world. So, and, and, with, and by doing that, they get to think about how they see the world. So, that's how I look at it. Wonderful. Gina, do you have any thoughts about what public art means to you? Um, well, on a daily basis, it's like contracts and emails and mechanical things <laughs> as an arts administrator and not as a visual artist. Um, but I, I think it's, I think ultimately public art is a democratizing force um, because like Jerry said, it's for everybody and it's for anybody. Um, it's not in an indoor setting that you might have to pay a entrance to to be in um, and to go view and it's something that, that every it's it's there for the public and so there's something really s special about that well I'm gonna switch our view here for a sec so we can see everyone um, oh we lost Karen well <laughs> Um, well, I want to thank all of you for your persistence, your perseverance, your good humor, being open to, to these experiences. I want to thank uh, my team, Gina, thank you so much, and the rest of the team at ACT um, who made this possible, our colleagues at Public Property and in Building Inspections and all the other departments who helped with these installations, uh, Ron and the crew from the Civic Center, thank you for providing that amazing site again for Dreamweave, um, and of course our sponsors. I want to thank the City of Providence, Mayor Alorza, City Council, Providence Tourism Council, all of the sponsors who, who were able to stick with us this year. Very grateful for, for that. But really, this is about this is about you four, and I am so, so grateful to you for, for sharing your work, for helping us to transform downtown Providence in a moment when I think all of us need to have a little inspiration, a little imagination, a little hope. Um, so thank you for that. We sure hope to be back later this summer. The work will be on view through the end of October. Um, so stay tuned for more opportunities to interact with these pieces and to meet the artists. Um, and we hope to see you next year downtown next June for PBD Fest. So thank you, everyone.